Uh, well, first of all, I'd like to thank everyone for uh, coming this morning. I know uh, uh, everyone in the room is uh, busy with their own schedules and uh, all their activities. We have some really great stuff to talk about from the Utah State University Space Weather Center. Uh, and uh, if you have uh, particularly questions uh, afterwards, uh, not only myself, I have a couple colleagues here, uh, Drs. Robert Schunk and Herbert Carlson here up in front, who could also uh, uh, answer questions as well. Um, <clears throat> the topic today uh, may seem uh, to be linking two incongruous uh, topics. One is space weather, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what space weather is as we go through this this morning, but also uh, disaster recovery. But uh, in fact, as we found over the last uh, couple decades now, as we become a much more advanced, technologically uh, advanced society, and in particular where we have a space component for many of our uh, parts of our technology, we have become much more susceptible to a phenomena called space weather. So um, in particular, uh, before I, I go into the details of space weather, let me just kind of mention that, that at certain moments in, uh, in our history as a civilization, we always find that, that there's uh, times that really move us to, to make breakthroughs in new areas. Uh, great disasters really tend to help us move forward and improve the human condition. And uh, that was certainly the case in a, uh, for us in a, in a small way at Utah State University for the Space Weather Center in relation to the Great East uh, Japan earthquake about uh, a few months ago on March 11th of this year. When uh, uh, that Friday afternoon earthquake hit, it was a magnitude nine uh, earthquake, one of the largest uh, in recorded history. Massive destruction. We all watched on the television the uh, horrific scenes, not only from the earthquake itself, but also from the, uh, the tsunami that uh, soon hit within tens of minutes throughout many of the coastal villages across uh, northern uh, Japan. Uh, the, in some areas, the tsunami reached a height of 124 feet, and it was a, a really uh, major event. Of course, on the west coast of the United States, I think Crescent City uh, had uh, tsunami damage, um, and there were some other areas as well. As of uh, a few weeks ago, the total damages from that particular event, the combination of the tsunami and the earthquake, had already totaled $300 billion that was personal as well as public sector uh, infrastructure uh, damages. Uh, 10,000 or more people missing, uh, over 14,000 dead, and uh, they're still recovering uh, people from the, from the uh, disaster area. And in particular, uh, what we noticed in <clears throat> that uh, tsunami and earthquake disaster that was then followed by their triple strike, of course, of the nuclear uh, uh, plant uh, uh, meltdown was that much of the infrastructure in this type of disaster uh, was demolished. Not only the, the roads over here that you can see, the, uh, the government infrastructure, but also there's uh, the, the entire communications network uh, was disabled in northern Japan. This is a, a photo that we found of a, a village area, that's their local cell tower, and of course you can see that uh, the damage to their, their building and the, the base of the tower uh, rendered that particular unit uh, unavailable. The landlines were down, uh, uh, communications were down, and this became then a major uh, issue for disaster recovery. Now before we go into some of the details on, on what we at Space Weather Center did to try and help, uh, in this case, the Japanese, uh, let me back up a step and introduce you, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the topic of space weather, uh, I'd like to, to uh, explain a little bit of what we mean about it. We, we don't mean taking pictures of Earth from space like the GOES satellites do and that we look at on our weather channel uh, every night. We all know that the Earth uh, and the Sun are energetically connected. We also uh, hear through the news reports and the media that the sun, uh, every uh, 11 years or so, goes through this massive cycle 
uh, where there's a lot of solar flares, a lot of coronal mass ejections, and the photons fr from those events on the sun reach here within eight minutes at the speed of light. Uh, some of those are in X-rays uh, and in the extreme ultraviolet. In addition, there's charged particles that come from those events, and those charged particles make it from the sun to the earth, 93 million miles, in the space of anywhere from a few hours to a couple days. And when those charged particles interact with our Earth's and our near-Earth environment, it causes disruptions as well, as, as we'll see. Uh, so the combination of the photons, the particles, and the electromagnetic fields of the sun, those are all the three main elements of space weather that now affect us here in our near-Earth space environment and even all the way down to the ground. Now, um, we've drawn up a little bit of a cartoon here to explain some of the ways in which this space weather affects us. So, for example, uh, we have the Earth here. We also have uh, uh, the different atmosphere regions. And in particular, uh, if we have a massive coronal mass ejection, it tends to cause what are <coughs> called uh, geomagnetic storms at Earth. What, one of the effects of geomagnetic storms is to have aurora. But for the really big events, you can have disruptions of the electric power grid where the ground-induced current actually charges up and destroys transformers along the power grid. This happened in March of 1989, and the entire northeast uh, sector of Canada went down. So you can imagine the impact today of an entire uh, regional power grid going down and what it would have uh, uh, in terms of uh, economy. There's uh, a lot of use now of our communication satellites out of geosynchronous orbit. The signals going to and from those communication satellites have to pass through an ionosphere and going out there uh, to 22,000 miles. And those are disrupted by the electrons in the ionosphere up here uh, in a process called scintillation. <clears throat> radio waves, and in particular, uh, high frequency radio is disturbed by the uh, ionosphere. Navigation, particularly uh, aviation, uh, has a lot of susceptibility to space weather. Now, when we're all flying in a plane commercially, we tend not to think about the space weather component. But in particular, there's three areas in which space weather really affect us. When these really large solar flares go off, it affects the HF radio communications. After 9-11, FAA required that all planes coming in and out of the United States had to have constant radio communication. Uh, and for most of the transoceanic flights and the polar flights, this means they have to use high frequency radio. When the big solar flares go off, it completely disrupts or makes that HF communication unusable. In addition, planes use GPS, and they also are susceptible to the radiation environment from galactic cosmic rays and from solar energetic particles. So if you fly from Los Angeles, over to Frankfurt, maybe an 11-hour flight, you're and you're going to go over Canada, you're going to get basically the equivalent of a chest X-ray in terms of radiation as you fly at those altitudes. Astronauts uh, have radiation uh, issues, of course, with space weather. Uh, there's perturbations to the upper atmosphere where satellites fly, and it causes drag on them and changes to their orbits. And then, of course, out of geosynchronous orbit, the massive fluxes of electrons during these big storms will cause accumulation of electrons on the surface of these spacecraft, and that then causes discharging or sparks, and you can lose solar arrays, you can use, lose instruments, and thus render uh, communication satellites uh, uh, unusable. And this is a common cause uh, when, um, uh, when we find anomalies for, uh, <clears throat> for communication satellite outages. Um, okay, so that's, uh, that's Space Weather 101 right there. You, you, you got the basic idea. The sun's out there. It affects us here. Um, what does this have to do with uh, uh, disasters? All right. We all recognize in the U.S. we've had a number of events that uh, have been uh, significant historically. 
Katrina, six years ago, August 29, 2005. Category 5 hurricane. It strikes the coast of uh, uh, the Gulf Coast of the United States between uh, Texas and uh, Florida. Uh, there's major damage that occurs, particularly in the Louisiana area. Now, we all recall that, uh, that the recovery period for Katrina took a long time, much longer than certainly the people in the affected area wanted. But uh, one to two weeks, one week after the hurricane, people were still living in the uh, stadium there in, in New Orleans. And within two weeks, they were still out here in the Gulf uh, doing uh, recovery operations and helping uh, get FEMA organized on the, um, on the ground. Seven, eight days, eight days, eight or nine days after the uh, hurricane went off, right in the middle of the disaster recovery period, when communications were really critical, there was still a lot of problems going on, the fourth largest flare in recorded history went off. It was an X-17 class flare. NOAA Space Weather Prediction Center put out an alert and said, this is a massive event. It will affect communications at Earth. It just so happened that uh, uh, at Earth, uh, who was on the light, the, the day side of the Earth, uh, it was North America and South America, and in particular, <clears throat> this um, massive amount of electrons really wiped out radio communications in the Gulf region uh, right at the time that they're in the uh, 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 disaster recovery period. So, recognizing some of the problems in the past, uh, what we at Space Weather Center have been trying to do now is develop capabilities uh, that can provide a knowledge of what radio communications are available at the current time in forecast mode, what can we predict in the future, and also uh, understanding uh, how these events are going to affect us uh, and our technology for communications and navigation especially. So that gets us to the Space Weather Center at USU. It was organized a couple of years ago. Uh, it's uh, one of the USTAR projects. We're so thankful that uh, the state of Utah uh, and the um, ARRA uh, funding, in addition to that, has really helped fund a lot of these activities. Uh, the Space Weather Center was one of those, and so we are an investment by the citizens of Utah in order to take intellectual property from Utah State and commercialize it for the, for the betterment of our society. Our mission is to provide operational space weather for 21st century challenges to reduce space weather risk. Well, that's kind of broad, but let me kind of go into some detail of what that means. In the Japan case from a few months ago in March, uh, we recognized within the first day or two uh, uh, at uh, Space Weather Center that cert and, and certainly across uh, uh, many uh, people around the world recognized that these cascading types of disruptions, the earthquake, tsunami, and the nuclear disaster, they all uh, disrupt and, and destroy the infrastructure. As the recovery efforts uh, developed, backup communications are needed. In the United States, FEMA's main backup communication system is HF, or high-frequency radio. So when all the main landline and cell tower communications goes out, it's HF communications that they use. This is true in Japan as well. And so they have their uh, HF radio as their primary link between Tokyo and the northern districts and prefectures in Japan. At Space Weather Center, <coughs> by Sunday, uh, we had decided that we could, uh, two days after the event, we had decided that we could do something to help the folks there. And within uh, six days <coughs> after the, uh, this earthquake first hit, uh, we, had a, our, whoops, we had our website up and going uh, as part of our space weather website. And in particular, what we we're uh, providing, along with the consultation of a number of Japanese HF uh, emergency workers, they wanted to know what the next three hours were going to bring for their planning purposes for their radio communications going up, skipping off the ionosphere, and coming back down over the mountain range to the next area over. So we provided that kind of capability over here. And then globally, we provided for the rest of the world 
a knowledge of which frequency people can use to communicate with Japan uh, at any time of day or night and uh, 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 at any point around the world. So that capability uh, we've now uh, provided uh, to FEMA for evaluation, and they're taking a look at it. Whoops. We, uh, we don't need uh, an iPad pairing, so let's, uh, all right. Um, okay, so how do we get to this kind of uh, development? Well, first of all, uh, I think everyone is pretty much familiar that models and data are generally what drive a lot of our technology. Uh, that's also true for the ionosphere. And uh, what we've done at Utah State University is <clears throat> we've taken the best of, uh, of both models and, uh, and data. For our models, what we do is we, we have a, a system we've called GAME, Global Assimilation of Ionosphere Measurements. And what we do is we have a physics-based model of the ionosphere. But physics-based models, even though we have one of the best in the world right here, uh, only go so far. And what you, uh, in addition, need is you need data. So in the center panel, you can see that there's all these GPS TEC receiver stations. This is a case of the United States. And those stations provide a ground truth for the data of how the ionosphere is affecting specific little receivers. If you take the ensemble of all that, just like the National Weather Service does with our lower atmosphere weather models, they take all the temperature measurements and the wind measurements. So they ingest data into their models to get a much better weather forecast. We now do the same thing right here. We ingest data. We take 10,000 measurements from about 400 stations around the world every 15 minutes. And we take those data and readjust this physics-based ionosphere so now it not only much more consistently matches what's going on in the real life, but we also now have, for the areas where there are no sensors, we now have a physics-based solution that's consistent with what's going on around it. So the bottom line here is that we now, uh, in the world, really have produced what's called the gold standard for the ionosphere. This game system uh, is uh, used by Air Force Weather Agency and at Utah State University, what we're doing is we're commercializing this in particular to um, uh, develop some derivative products. Uh, <clears throat> this little uh, uh, graphic, uh, animated graphic, will kind of give you a, a sense and feel of what it is that you can see using this system. So we're over here in Salt Lake. We go over uh, 150 miles to the northeast over to Bear Lake. And we sit on the west shore of it at Bear Lake Observatory up on the hill. <clears throat> and you look out, and right over here on the left part of the, the plot is uh, north. This is east right here, south, west, and then north again. So you go around the entire horizon, and then you go up in elevation from the ground level directly overhead. All of these little triple boxes here are GPS satellites separated by 15 minutes in each orbit track. And then the colors are the total electron content. It's the number of electrons that you're looking through as you go to this satellite. So let's say we're looking at this set of satellites here from Bear Lake Observatory. We now can determine from our entire system, from any point in the world, and also in forecast mode, how many electrons are going to be between us at our location and that particular satellite, whether it's a GPS satellite or geosynchronous satellites that stay fixed up there. Now, that may seem interesting. Uh, we saw how this animation occurred and, and the electrons changed throughout the day. But the key thing here now is that if we know how many electrons in general we're going through, that gives us an ability to not only know how radio frequencies can skip through those, those electrons, but also how GPS signals coming down through those electrons are going to be delayed and hence affect the accuracy of our, uh, uh, of our smartphones or our GPS receivers on the ground. 
So that entire game system now enables us to create derivative products, and that is what we are doing at Space Weather Center, derivative products for both HF signal strength and GPS uncertainty. All right, <clears throat> now this is um, uh, Space Weather 102 in the next slide here, uh, two slide, slides, and it's particularly related to uh, high frequency radio. I wanted to just give you a sense of what we're talking about, of what the relationship is between sending out radio signals their relationship to the ionosphere, and we know the ionosphere is already being perturbed and buffeted and changed very dynamically by the solar wind and, and the sun. So we saw in an earlier slide that there's different layers in the ionosphere. We can go from, say, 60 miles or, or 80 miles all the way up to 500 miles, and there's different densities across the planet and different structures occurring in the ionosphere. So you can imagine these different layers. And in effect, what you do in this cartoon is you can sit here at a particular location. We sit in this room, and if we want to transmit a signal over to Japan, we can select a certain frequency, and we know that it will go along this entire path and reach over here on the other side of the planet. So that's what the ham radio operators do. That's what airlines do when you're sitting there flying uh, transoceanic, and that's what uh, DOD does and uh, FEMA does. If you take a certain frequency and aim it too high, uh, the ionosphere does not reflect, and you just go right on through. So it's, it's really dependent on how many electrons are in this layer and what frequency you use, and so it's all changing very dynamically. That's been a big problem since we started using HF radio a century ago, and we're finally at the point to begin to do this. Question? You said aiming. Are those uh, signals directional? Uh, yes. So, for example, um, <clears throat> depends on the type of transmitter antenna you have, uh, but generally uh, you can uh, transmit in, in different directions. That's correct. So, uh, because HF radio is really designated pretty much internationally as the backup radio communi uh, backup communication capability for disasters, it now becomes an important capability to know what frequencies are available and uh, uh, what, uh, how, how to plan to use them. So that's in fact what we've done for Japan with these different kind of uh, uh, plots that we give them where you have Japan here, the rest of the world around here, and at this given frequency, which is 14 megahertz or uh, 21 meters, for those of you who are ham operators, uh, you can see that you have good, which is green, uh, moderate signal strength, and anywhere where it's red or black, you have no capability of transmitting at that frequency. Um, and then within Japan, we do the same kind of thing. So this capability has now been extended. Uh, the DOD, FEMA, ham radios, and aviation are all uh, looking at these capabilities. For the ham radios in particular, uh, we are just now, I will give you a preview. Any reporters in the room, please hold off. This is not public information yet, but uh, you all are privileged guests, so I will uh, divulge this. A, a month from now, uh, we are opening up a, a website. It's our very first commercial spinoff here from this center within the first two years. It's a thing called QUP. Uh, we have a website called QUP now. And this is for uh, ham radio operators in particular, for them to be able to figure out from their location anywhere in the world uh, what frequencies are available that night or last night or in the next uh, few days for their use. And that'll be a subscription-based kind of activity at a very uh, modest price. The uh, aviation component, <clears throat> I just want to throw this in because um, we all, uh, or most of us fly in one uh, sense or another. Some people uh, uh, fly between the US and China, for example. This is a, a polar route that uh, United uh, does. And in particular, um, we remember the Katrina event. Nine days later after Katrina, September 7, 2005, NOAA announces that major flare. There is a uh, United flight uh, traveling from 
Chicago to uh, Hong Kong, and they experienced a complete blackout for radio communications because they were on the day side of the hemisphere. Uh, so what in effect happened is because they were then violating the FAA regulation that they had no HF communications, they had to divert that flight from Hong Kong and land in Anchorage. Uh, the cost to uh, United was three hours, 180 minutes. Uh, they had lost fuel, and the cost uh, started at $250,000 for that one stopover. For stopovers like this, the aviation industry tells us that the expense per incident per flight can easily start reaching a million dollars per flight. That's if you have to put up passengers overnight in hotels, if you have to drop off cargo, uh, if you have to bring in more fuel, if you have to bring in another air crew because your current air crew has exceeded its, its flying hours. So commercial aviation is extremely interested in what's happening uh, with this from a, a bottom line economic uh, perspective. Because of that, uh, what we are doing at Space Weather Center is a second aviation product. This is an example of the LA to uh, Frankfurt flight. Uh, it goes over the Hudson Bay, uh, the southern part of uh, Greenland, Iceland, uh, the UK, and then into Frankfurt. It's about an 11-hour flight. Uh, if you're flying it, you get about a chest x-ray worth of radiation. If there's a big flare going off, you'll get three or four chest x-rays within that one, uh, that one flight. Um, and so what we're doing for air traffic control stations and the major commercial carriers is to provide a, an ability for them to know the primary and secondary frequencies that each of these air traffic control stations can, communi can communicate at in the event that there's these flares or just during normal operations. There's uh, three major uh, airlines uh, that we have non-disclosure agreements with right now that are testing this capability. Every morning, there's uh, 6,000 planes that are flying across the US. So this is uh, this morning, this is uh, uh, what it looks like. Each one of those dots represents a plane. And um, uh, when there's big, major solar events that happen, the system that the FAA uses called WAS, Wide Area Augmentation System, it's GPS dependent and it helps them keep the planes spaced properly between each other and it helps the planes land. And that system went down, particularly during the October 2003 Halloween period, uh, went down for two or three days uh, because they simply lost the GPS accuracy due to the disturbances from the ionosphere uh, upon GPS signals. Um, finally, bringing it down to a more mundane level, many of us have smartphones um, in our smartphones here, uh, within the next uh, year or two, uh, you will be potentially, or your uh, son or daughter will be sitting at a, at a uh, uh, bus bench and will want to know if the bus is on time or not. Uh, at uh, some of the major airports, they already do this for the shuttles. Uh, and on your smartphone, you'll be able to tell uh, from the GPS link to that bus where it is on its route. You'll be able to see its route information. So GPS uncertainty is, uh, is coming all the way down to these devices. Uh, many of our devices have the, uh, the, the single frequency GPS chips in them already. And um, <clears throat> the, um, uh, this is the test case I did over in my office on campus at USU. Uh, I'm sitting in my office, which is the green dot. I pull out my iPhone, and I want to know, I push the blue dot for the map to see where it tells me I'm at. It tells me I'm 100 yards away over in the parking lot. There's obviously a lot of uncertainty still. Not all of it is due to the ionosphere. There's other issues. But the ionosphere component does give uncertainty, and we are now working to commercialize a capability for even our, our personal devices to be able to have much greater accuracy, and that will certainly help in emergency situations as well. The way we do this, uh, this is the, the Space Weather 103, and I promise this is the, the end of our Space Weather tutorial. Our current, uh, our current phones right now <coughs> have a chip in them 
And this chip in here uses what we call a climatology, climatological representation of the ionosphere. So it's basically where the sun is right now, and it tells you change the number of meters by which you, you correct the signal from that GPS from here out to that satellite out there, correct it by some representation as shown here. For this particular day in October uh, last fall, here's what the actual ionosphere was for the game, and that's in fact what we're now able to provide. So this kind of new capability now gives a much better capability for understanding the GPS uncertainty and then a correction to the GPS within our, our own devices. So we're testing out some abilities for that right now. Uh, <clears throat> finally, as our last uh, couple comments here, uh, what I'd like to do is just point out that we have uh, a number of activities where we try and do public education as well as uh, professional uh, tools on our uh, uh, on iPhones and iPads and iPods. Right now, we have the first and really the flagship uh, space weather uh, application. It's called Space WX. Uh, right now, what this thing is, I pull it up on my app right here. This is the tip of an iceberg of which there's 119 different real-time data sets for space weather coming into this device. And 19 different institutions, agencies, universities, companies around the world are helping provide that information through models and data and so forth. So uh, we're doing an Android version. Uh, it'll be ready this fall. It's being used in 43 countries. Um, we charge $1.99 for it, so please, if you have an iPhone, go out and buy it. <laughs> it supports the Space Weather Center. Uh, but uh, it really is pretty remarkable that here at the beginning of the second decade of the century, we now, in our hands, uh, can pull out uh, an app and uh, right here, uh, I know no one can really see this in the room, but I touch this right here, and I will get up a, a picture of the current sun. So it, it really is a, a remarkable capability. And that picture of the sun uh, was taken uh, a half hour ago from space. Some of the data comes in as, as uh, low latency as uh, one and two minutes ago. So to conclude, uh, what we're looking forward to for the second half of this year we're doing a major project to improve our real-time accuracy for GPS. In particular, for these smartphone devices, we hope to uh, 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 not only demonstrate, we've got a good project uh, to complete here uh, early fall, and then we're uh, talking with chip makers to begin to include in chips for everyone's uh, use. Uh, we're going to charge a penny more on your phone bill for it, by the way. But uh, uh, basically what will happen is that you'll have much greater accuracy in your, in your smartphones. <clears throat> um, for communications, uh, particularly aviation, emergency responders, and defense purposes, we're doing a lot of work for improving uh, real-time and forecast communications. We uh, are continually providing a lot of this information out to the public uh, through this app, uh, as an example. And in general, uh, when these disasters happen, we, uh, we don't want to let them go by uh, without um, at least uh, acknowledging that many people have sacrificed uh, their lives in some of these cases. And so we may as well try and do our best to improve the human condition uh, by learning from these examples and seeing what we can do better. That's what we've done at Utah State University Space Weather Center. Uh, it's part of the U-Star program. Uh, sponsored and, and funded by the citizens of Utah. And we thank, uh, we thank the state legislature so much for uh, all the support over the last couple of years. That's the presentation. Uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to spend a couple minutes and answer them. Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, good question. The question is, is that uh, there's not only the GPS system, that's a US system run by Air Force, but there's the GNSS, uh, GLONASS, uh, uh, which is a, uh, there's a Russian system. The Chinese are putting up a system. Uh, Europeans uh, have a Galileo. So there's a number of GPS type of satellite systems e emerging, not only run by the United States. Uh, the, um, and first of all, the answer is yes. We are working with those systems. Uh, quite fortunately, the overall broad GNSS community, which is the, the broad name for all the GPS type of stuff, that community has recognized that there's many, many users around the world for all these GPS type products. And so what they've done is uh, in, uh, in some of the files, the Rhinex files, for example, they produce, uh, they include not only the GPS satellites, but the GLONASS satellites. And um, in general, our system is incorporating both uh, GPS and GLONASS uh, 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 information right now in our assimilation of those TEC data into improving our ionosphere. So yes, we are using Yeah. That's a that's a really good question. Uh, what's the trend of solar flares? Uh, what what happens with them? You know, what's the time cadence type of thing? Uh, there's a couple parts to the question um, or to the answer. First of all, in a broad climatology sense, the uh, the sun becomes very active with a lot of flares and coronal mass ejections on an approximate 11 year, 12 year a 10 to 12 year time scale. We say 11 years, just for ballpark. So we are now, uh, uh, and, and so on an 11 year cycle, for example, coming up in 2012, 2013, will be the peak of this next cycle in which we will see a lot of flares. Uh, there's a minimum of solar cycles that happened over the last few years where there's very, very few solar flares. So that's kind of a cyclic thing that happens and it's because of how the magnetic fields of the sun are evolving. Um, so over the next few years, we expect to see a lot more solar flares. And they happen during the rise of a solar cycle, during the maximum, and then during the decline period as well. So basically, we, we expect to see a much more increased incidence of solar flares over the next um, six to seven years. Now, in addition to that, um, as far as how often they occur, uh, the really big events, uh, you will have X-class flares that occur uh, on the order of a few uh, really big ones per year. You may have smaller X-class, uh, dozens per year, and then smaller M-class, hundreds per year. So uh, from M-class on larger, there's uh, M and X are really the largest ones. Uh, those are the ones that uh, will affect some communications either moderately or significantly. And uh, uh, those are, are anywhere from small disturbances hundreds of times per year to a few per year for the really, uh, the really big events. So that's kind of a, a generic uh, uh, cadence for those type of things. All right. Yeah, well, I, I didn't even attempt to bring up the sun, as you can tell. <laughs> but the ham radio market, is that growing? Is it stable? Is it shrinking? Um, question, ham radio uh, community, is it growing, shrinking? What about that overall market uh, capability? The, uh, there's about 300,000 uh, ham radio operators in the U.S. Uh, as many of you might know, there's different classes of ham licenses. Uh, um, some, uh, some licenses only provide a limited capability for line of sight communications. Uh, and that's the majority of uh, ham radio operators. Uh, there's a smaller segment of that, uh, 10 to 20% of it, that um, uh, have the, uh, a license where they're able to propagate signals uh, over large distances, uh, over the horizon. And so um, that market segment 
tends to be relatively stable. There's people, of course, that uh, uh, retire or uh, pass away. Uh, there's new people that do come into it, but it's a relatively stable market. In some parts of the world, it's growing a little bit. I've noticed uh, on some of our web hits for some of our stuff, there's a whole lot of ham radio operators in Turkey. I don't know why, but, uh, but there are. Um, and uh, let's see. So I think uh, globally, there's some growth in it, but uh, it's, a, it's an old technology in the sense that it, it really was invented about uh, almost a century ago. <clears throat> um, the key to it and the reason that we're actually doing this website for ham radio operators is, is um, uh, very interesting. It turns out that ham radio operators are really dedicated people. They like what they do. And, and they will, you know, they'll spend money on their equipment. But in particular, uh, they really get into trying to get the best communications and they like to do these radio links. And that community serves as a really good prototyping community for us. We've already got a half a dozen hams on non-disclosure agreements with us who are providing feedback for this site, uh, helping us develop some of these uh, ham products that can be used. We are taking that body of knowledge and information, and that then will help in terms of the, uh, the DOD, particularly the Army, has been interested in some of these capabilities. And so having a commercial solution uh, that we can then um, uh, really make available for DOD uses and uh, emergency responder uses is, is uh, an end goal out of this thing. <clears throat> but the hams are really great at giving us a lot of good feedback, some of it negative, you know, uh, some of it uh, very positive, but it's been very uh, good experience for us. So. Yeah. Ken, congratulations on an excellent presentation. So much of this, of course, depends on the cell sites being up and running during a disaster. I mean, you mentioned, showed the pictures in Japan, and of course we have the ham radio as a backup, but how, what are we doing to fortify that first line of communication to the cell sites? Um, good, good point. The, for those of you who didn't hear, uh, what's happening in terms of fortifying cell sites and the, the communications infrastructure prior to uh, disaster uh, 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 events occurring? Um, Japan, as you probably realize, is one of the most earthquake-prepared countries in the entire world, if not the most prepared. Their building codes are superb for earthquakes, even better than... Uh, than anything that we have in the United States. Um, and so um, in terms of the general level of preparation, and this is not my area of expertise, but at least what I've observed is that there's a, a general sense of, and it's not the same across the board for every country and for every region, but there is a general sense of trying to become more prepared for disasters in general, for building codes and structures. Um, for the communication side of it, uh, if you lose cell towers you know, during a, an earthquake or a terrorist thing or flood or whatever the case may be, um, you may end up having those individual sites down. You can't do anything about it. But FEMA, is uh, for the United States, uh, we've been in discussions with FEMA for a couple years now. Uh, we briefed them uh, two years ago out in their Denver center. Uh, which is uh, uh, their, their main center doing the space weather stuff, <clears throat> they, um, they are now actively looking at how to fortify their HF communications network uh, for the big flare events and the big geomagnetic storm events. And that is uh, a new development over the last two years on their part. So they are uh, actively looking at our, uh, our emergency responder stuff, um, and uh, we would like them to take this on as a... Uh, uh, we would like them to be our customer on providing some of this, um, but uh, they are certainly evaluating, and, and it's a good thing that they're, they're looking at this. So in terms of their preparation, I think, I think from the communications infrastructure, there's not much you can do about individual towers, but um, uh, for that backup structure, I think they're doing something finally. Uh, yeah, so I think that's probably my level of expertise on that. Okay. All right. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.